Thanks, Rob. Then I'm off. Um, the insulin. Um, just a quick background about me. Excuse me if I don't use my arm much. Um, I've just had it all printed on for a third time, so tension is kind about a little bit. Um, 15 years ago, 21 years old, joined the ambulance service up in the northeast of Scotland. Um, straight off the street, no medical background. Um, loved it. From the first day I went live on the road, loved it. Really did. I'd recommend it as a career to anyone. Up in the northeast, we get a lot of trauma, so I spent probably five or six days a week crawling about wrecks, um, working with people that were really, really life in the line. Moved down here, more medical stuff they worked with down here, we get a lot of shooting, stabbing, things like that. But the majority of the stuff is medical, intellectual, heart attacks, and what have you. Doesn't really matter if the person's got traumatic injuries or if they're medical suffering, they need us to be the same type of person throughout. And that's someone who's passionate about their job, just wants to help people make them feel better. That's all I do. That's what my job is, and I love it. And I can't see myself doing anything else now. I've been invited today to tell you about probably the worst day, definitely of my career, but um, maybe of my life so far, to be honest. On the 1st of September 2005, um, I was working out in West Lothian. And we were asked to attend a tribal nine call to a young man who was unconscious due to an overdose of amitriptyline um, and alcohol. Fine, turned up. Nice house, met by a nice woman, no signs of any danger anywhere. There was an error with the address on route, so we spoke to the control room on route. And they said, yeah, it's <coughs> Perris's Bit of Avenue or whatever it was. Went into the house, obviously like a grandparent's house, you know, like net curtains and frilly doilies, and all very, very pleasant. No shouting, no screaming. No alarm bells. When you do my job, you take a scene in in the first 20 seconds and your alarm bells start ringing and putting the ring top. No concern. Into the sitting room, met by a male on my left, stretched out on a settee in the box of sorts, and who ended up being family as well. That was the end of the peace and quiet, to be honest. Um, knelt down and introduced myself to the gentleman as we normally do. Hello, it's the ambulance service. Could you open your eyes for me? We're here to help you. Nothing. I'm going to put my hand on your shoulder, small shake, and up he went. I asked the family to leave the room, and the uh, patient was behind me here now. And then I turned back around, the gentleman I was with. We stand and say back to me and there was the patient now somehow on his feet on the other side. My colleague stepped to his right and the patient punched me in the face. No provocation and no warning. 22 minutes that man assaulted us for. He was naked by now. He was strong. He had the, the strength of three or four guys. It's quite common, especially with like some amitriptyline. <clears throat> he kicked, he punched, he bit. He tried to smash televisions on my head, tried to pull glass tables onto me, so I reminded him he was naked, and then he stopped that. So he did have a sense of control. He did know what he was doing. All I really remember is um, him pulling, we tried to keep him on the ground, I should maybe state that. We weren't upright fighting with this guy, like boxers in the ring. For his safety, the floor was the best place. For us, we didn't know the strength training. We've got no, I haven't done breakaway training or anything, so it was a case of where is the safest place and where is the easiest place to keep him. The answer was on the floor. Taking on tripling, the risk of death is really high and it's really sudden. Put on the floor, kept in there, tried to phone the control room three times. The phone connected and I got hung up on. See, 
his friend. My handheld radio failed, didn't even ring out. And I had to call the police. When the police arrived, it took four of them and two of us to get this gentleman into the street, into cuffs, put into the ambulance. And even when it was 40, 45 minutes later, this man is getting put face down, which is not something I advocate. But I couldn't move my arm at this stage. I was really at the stage where I knew if this went wrong, I wasn't going to be able to do anything physically anyway. They still trying to bite. Fair enough, took him to the hospital, got a mouthful from the doctor because why were we bringing him in in the first place? Dealt with that, waited five hours for me to get assessed by the doctor. I can't use my right arm now. Can't feel my hand. The pain is unbelievable. I phone the control room. Now, I've got a really good relationship with control room. They're called control for one reason. They tell me what to do. They choose what I do. So, you know, it's always a good idea to be a good care for people to feed you. Where were you, I said? I couldn't get through. We've just been attacked by this man. Where were you? They could hear what was going on at the other end of that phone and did nothing. They didn't phone the police to chase them up. They phoned the police and told them we were outside. So the police downgraded the response thing. The biggest thing though that hurt the most that night was the control room manager when I phoned back to apologise for my terrible attitude on the phone to let her know that we were being booked in to be assessed. She told me it was me that needed the apology from her. Why? They had two violence warnings on that job. They knew when they gave us that job. Remember I said I spoke to them about the stress check? They even knew at that stage, halfway to the job, that this man was violent. They knew he was alert. They knew he'd just assaulted his mother. So they knew he wasn't unconscious. Bad enough for myself. So that's me now off my work. I'm now five years down the line. And those five years have been absolutely horrendous stuff going on after this really tragedy. I was basically told for the first two years that I didn't have the pain I said I had. That I was pretending that I couldn't really use my right arm. I assaulted on the Thursday night. I had a phone call from my line manager on the Friday morning. What happened? I got a meeting with the general manager that wouldn't want to see what happened. Told him. Didn't hear from him again until November when my pay was getting cut to half pay. Fair enough. Still waiting for the welfare officer to phone me. And I got OHS in the October because I had to go back to my work too early because I can't live with no wages. I went on holiday the following week. Six adults, a 10 month old and an 18 month old. And a dog, my shadow. I had to go on that holiday because I couldn't dress myself. I couldn't feed myself, couldn't get myself in and out of bed, had broken ribs, couldn't use my right arm, couldn't bend, couldn't straighten, wasn't sleeping. The pain, honestly, I've never felt anything like it. Couldn't climb the shoelaces, couldn't shower myself. I had to be bathed and washed like one of the toddlers that we had. Couldn't walk the dog. So now I'm on my holiday in Centre Parks, which is where I've been on every year for four or five years, and I normally play racket sports. And swim. Just watch. Couldn't help the children. 
Det er det Horrible. Det er absolut horrible vis. Jeg tror, det er en But I don't know what that's fine, that's me, that's the work. Went back in November. Went back on the road in the apron. <laughs> Things start to go downhill now. Who knew me before all this happened? And I'm getting around. I was one of the strongest, most independent, competent, and capable people you could ever meet. 21 years old, nine weeks training at college, first night on the road, and an ambulance was on my own. And I managed. And I continued to manage right up until this guy beat me up. I said I'm a coffee with a friend of mine who said, very well respect the occupation of health nurse. And very experienced lady. And then uh, she's going for a cup of coffee on She said, as I often do. And she says, so how are you sleeping? I'm like, oh, I'm not sleeping. Two years after the episode, she says, how are you eating? She says, you know, she says, you've got post-traumatic stress. Well, I say it exploded, honestly. It was unbelievable. How dare you? You're supposed to be my friend. How dare you speak to me like that and accuse me of these things? There's no way there's anything wrong with me. So the best of the world that's at fault. Not me. I'm not ill. I didn't realise that I couldn't go to a supermarket unless it's 3 o'clock in the morning and I would be on my own. Why? Because I was worried that if I went during the day, somebody's going to shout at me. Why would somebody choose to shout at me in this case? <laughs> then that's what I thought was going to happen. I took my dog for a walk and a young lad went past me on his bike. I ended up sitting in the grass verge in tears and I'm trying. I don't cry. I'm sitting in tears on the verge at the side of the path because all the lad he's done is with him passing in a fight. I'm no friends. I'm rid of all of them. Just got rid of them all. Don't answer phones. Don't answer doors. The world's a really bad place. Now when I think about it, I realise how well I was. I say I took a step off the planet for a little while. This is me coming back on it now. But believe me, you wouldn't want to be in my universe with me where I was. I'm a dog person. Dogs come before anything for me. And I had my old man Sam, who had dementia. He's a, he was a cracking character. I tried to rehome that dog. I was convinced that I couldn't even look after my dog. I wasn't worth anything to anyone. I got referred through that friend. She's still a friend, by the way. She put the assault very well. Um, got referred to the River Centre in Edinburgh. I don't know if any of you are aware of it. They only deal with the very, very top end post-traumatic stress. You've got to be like, <coughs> say, on another planet before they'll take you on board. I was there about two years. And I'm probably your least likely mental health candidate, to be honest. The first appointment sort of went, oh, hello, I'm your therapist, this is my name. And I went, uh-huh. And ended with, right, we'll make the appointment for next week anyway, and we'll just see which one of us can up. Oh. I was so, so in a black space. Didn't care if I saw tomorrow. Didn't want to kill myself. I'll make that clear. I was never suicidal. I didn't care if I saw tomorrow. Didn't care if I went out and got run over by a bus. Really didn't care. But, walking around along the road, seeing a child beside an adult without a hand getting held, panic. Panic. What if that child gets run over? I can't do anything about it because I am not worthy to wear an ambulance without shoes on. Eventually, somebody listened to me about the pain on the shoulder as well. This is after my boss telling me the assault was my own fault. The man I was working with 
sharing on that, but they didn't even try to use the mobile phone. The same man knew that patient was going to thump me and didn't tell me. So, after my boss has told me, tell me your fault, get out You just need my size 9, inserted in your rectum. That'll sort you out. I went through my post-traumatic stress training, and it was hard. Anybody that tells you that <laughs> you is lying, <laughs> oh no, well. Um, these girls were amazing. They put me back on track. <coughs> I've just had my third lot of surgery to repair the torn rotor, cuff, rotor rotator cuff injury. The guy severed my bicep. He actually ripped it off here. Try and make that work. <laughs> One lot of surgery, the guy stretched it to put it back on. Second lot of surgery, it was too tight, I had to get loosened off. That was last. January and last June. April there, just now, I've actually had my bicep surgically severed and attached outside the room. I don't know if my arm will ever work properly. I don't know if it will ever be pain free. I'm swimmer, can't swim. I don't know if any of you are sporty or athletic or what have you, but if you all think about the one thing that you do to de stretch, to cope with life, then imagine not being able to do it. <coughs> I'm five years down the line and I still can't do it. So, moving forward though, still wearing the uniform, still loving my job. No changes in service though. No new warning systems. I don't know who the controllers were, and it's two of them, by the way. Don't know who those two individuals were, and I've been told I will never know who they are. And if I do ever find out who they are, I am not allowed to discuss this with them. I'm not allowed to make them aware of what their mistake resulted in. And my gran always said things in life are only a mistake if you learn from them. If they don't know what their mistake was and don't know the severity of the consequence, then what are you going to learn or not? The guy got 18 months in jail. Well, he served 18 months, he got three years. I'm three years ahead and I'm still suffering. All for the warrant of two warnings. The information was on the screen. They were speaking to me anyway. That's all it took. And all it took after that was <coughs> the management following, the actions of management policy. It didn't happen yet. My fault. I was just going to have to accept that and move on. I don't care what anybody says. I know out there it's an environment now. We deal with guns and knives and threats and things and punches and kicks and spit or spam and all the things and stuff like But I will never, never, I'll talk to you again in 10 years when I've done 25 years here, I will never accept that as part of our duties. It is not part of anyone's work in life to have to go out and deal with that and just get on. I learned everything through this. I was always the one that helps people. <coughs> I'm everybody who got. They all come to me and offload them to me. I realised I didn't have the capacity or the ability to offload. Because everything that I could do to de stress, I can, I can ride my bike, I can swim, short walk, you know, I can even put butter on my toes, I can get the lid off the coffee jar and be in the coffee jar. People need support, they need help, but they need more. That guy may have been here anyway. If I had the police with me, he was probably <coughs> 15 
stayed in that manner anyway. I would not have entered that place without the police <coughs> by my side. Tough lesson for everyone involved. But I'm not done with me. I'm not Captain Harvey. I'm definitely not any of these things in there. So if it can help anyone, if you can use it at all. Any questions? <coughs> Seems like a good lawsuit, but not that. Can I ask what's changed within the service with regards to any uh, training? Nothing. Um, I got my de-escalation, um, what's that? Breakaway de-escalation, is that right? Yeah. I got that a couple of weeks after I went back to work. After the assault, I've got colleagues who got it before that. So they're knocking on about six, seven years. They've never had an update. And it's jujitsu stuff. <coughs> you know, so you, if they grab you by the hair, you can tap their hands like that or something. Doesn't matter anyway. What I learned afterwards is that all that uh, wouldn't have applied that night because he didn't actually grab me, throw me, or throw me. If that makes any sense, it was all punches and kicks. There was no physical holding on to me. I'm too wary for that. You know, he, he couldn't. What he did was he pulled me back to his chest and the steel went through my shoulder and my chest. That, that's what did it. And then he just continued to wrench and twist. So. No, they haven't changed it and they haven't updated and they haven't given people the yeah. um, In reference to use of force, what you were able to do, would you give any training on that? In reference to the fact that what he was doing to you, you were able to defend yourself and so on and so forth? No. We are not allowed to... The police are allowed to match like for like, okay? We are not allowed to even do that. But well, I wouldn't challenge that yeah. personally because the Criminal Law Act and so yeah. on and so forth would suggest that in the situation that you, you were in, mm -hmm. is that you could defend yourself up to whatever needs yeah. necessary. Yeah. We get told that at college and then we get told all the horror stories. And basically the answer they give you is run away. That's something I usually get asked. Why did we run away? <coughs> and I didn't run. See that door? That door is stressing me out just now. Five years on, that door stressed me out because she's sitting walking it and it's closed. That night, his family, four adults and then a couple of meals appeared afterwards, stood in the doorway and watched. Watched us take the beating. And now I can't, I can't cope with it anymore. And I can't cope with it even more so because Amanda. It's in front of it. I mean, how crazy is that? You know what I mean? It's like, come on, get a grip. The reason I reference that particularly in reference to that, all this training that we provide as well mm -hmm. is because there's too many training systems that tell people they cannot do or they shouldn't do or you're not allowed to do. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I'm not an advocate of build accreditation mm -hmm. um, because they do advocate that you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't inflict pain and you shouldn't do this. The unfortunate necessity behind what you encountered and what us as healthcare professionals and trainers encounter day to day is that certain situations we go beyond the need of not being able to do. Yeah. And I think the importance, perhaps for yourself and training and in every area where we come into contact with the public, whatever the domain, that staff should have a very clear understanding of when they get into those situations about what they are able to do and what they're governed by by law yeah. to do. We've been told if we raise our hands, whether it's in defence or not, the service will not support us. And that takes that's wrong then, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Is that a risk of that? Yeah, I was uh, sure. I, don't, I don't know, that's what, that's just what it is. That is what we are taught. Right. So, yes. Yeah. So, if you talk that, Mm -hmm. And this preventative measure in place, i.e. the bank's warning markers, why are they not used? 
that's the whole point of what I'm trying to get as a true answer. And you said that systems haven't changed because of this, but obviously you were in this. What about your colleagues? Are they more safety conscious? Are they at? Is there a, a masculine inside? I uh, went back on the road. I was in November. I started going back. I was on light duty to use my left arm, but I was told in the March after my boss tried to retire me four times. Um, that if I couldn't work in one of those things, you know, in the ambulance, there's no place for me in the ambulance service. So I went back out on one. But I was in a dress on one day and fed back to control. This guy's dangerous, he's a no kid speaker. <coughs> um, I need high warnings put on him. Do not approach without the police. What did the hospital discover? They already had those warnings on this guy. Hmm. Okay? Went out two days later because I was off the day in between because I'm on stage to turn so no consecutive shifts. Now I'm not very good with addresses, but I know places when I see them. Filling up to this address and saying, switch them up. I'm sure this is that guy. No, no, no. Sure. Phone control. Phone control. Same control team. Okay? Same control team. Any warnings on this address? No. You sure? No. Anyway, well, I'll finish out. Well, the station in question is because I knew I was right. Two of us have seen there, you know. And uh, the fact I walked in the door, my patient's greeting to me was, Morning, bitch, you again. <laughs> Police turned up, took him to the hospital, went back to the station. I want to talk to the shift manager. Is there warning on this job? Yes. Perhaps if you did go down that, that route and then you could have set price of it and then everybody would have to look at what happened to you and everybody would have been held responsible. So that might have in the long term helped all your colleagues by setting I know. The price down. I I am aware of all that, and it is something that I've been spoken to about. But do you know I'm not I just, the systems are there. The, the safety systems exist already. The support system is there. They are choosing not to. So what difference does it make? If what happened to me isn't severe enough, I'm the most severely injured paramedic in the UK. It's the first time anyone's ever been jailed for attacking a paramedic in the UK. If that's not enough to make them follow their own policies and procedures, then what difference does a man in a rope tell them to do? Do you know if you're involved with the HIV? Yes, my hospital, my address on the wrong, but you could put soft tissue injury with bruising. What? Can I ask uh, how much of a common occurrence this is to the ambulance service? To the severity that I have, it's very, very, very rare. Um, but even, uh, even an assault, uh, no, being no, a slap. No, 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 no. We get, seriously, we get attacked with weapons all the time. We get a punch, we get a kick. Um, even when there's things like alerts on houses or individuals. Yeah, I mean, the, the difference there is we won't go in without the police. Right. You know, that, that's why we have these warnings. We have a little bit of an issue just now as road staff because they've got these warnings as well where <coughs> no one asks my tips. All right? They can maybe phone and it sound like a dodgy phone call the way they can down the phone. All right? But their address is alerted, it's tagged, because that might be the only way they can get help. They can dial 999, but they'll be able to speak 10 days on their end. I don't want to be sitting outside their front door for 25 minutes waiting for a police officer to come. They're at that stage already when they're going to say, well, I need my help, and I will. So, please. <coughs> Um, with caution, with caution, police informed and police attendance. So if a 
I'm told it's violent, then I'm not, I'm not getting it down for the police there. And I have had people screaming and swearing and banging and rocking the ambulances, come in and do your job. And work with those effect. And I am not undoing sense of walking. I've been trapped in the back of an ambulance. While 15 and 20 youths have tried to tip it on its side. So I'm saying, we deal with these things all the time. The reason this job affected me so badly is because the people that I trust to keep me safe failed me. They're my only contact with the outside world. So they put me in the danger and then they weren't even there to see things at home to get out of it. What about your colleague as well? What about him? During that evening, um, mm -hmm. now you, you said he said that you didn't use the phone or yeah. didn't try and phone. Yeah. Um, what was he doing? Because you had a severe beating. Mm -hmm. What was he doing at that time? While I was getting beaten, hmm. he was helping restrain the gentleman on the floor. What injuries did he have? Nothing. Interesting. He was the bigger one of the two of us. Lynn, um, I think some of the points that have been raised so far are really um, very valid and, and interesting. There's, there's one part of your story which I think the gentleman just touched on that really interested me. Um, you uh, called, you, you managed to make a call three times. Could you elaborate on how you managed to do that in the middle of this confrontation? And, and uh, particularly I have one interesting question which is about any perceptual, you know, how was your vision, how was your hearing? Any perceptual distortions you were experiencing at the time? Exceptionally heightened. Um, I'm a very aware person anyway. You don't do this job for long before you learn to have some 360 pound vision. You know, it's like a granny used to say, you have the eyes in the back of my head. <laughs> you know, it's just felt those. Um, the reason I managed to make the phone calls, that was that there have been four phone calls, because I phoned the police as well. I'll be honest, I was kneeling on the guy's neck at the time that I made the police call. I'm not going to lie about that. Um, because of what he'd taken, um, he'd tire very quickly. And what he would do is he would reserve his energy. So every now and then he would like not pass out because he was awake for like 10 or 15 seconds at a time. So it would allow me to just speak down on him. I mean, there's records, the control room have admitted that I tried to contact them because they could hear what was going on. So yeah, I tried. I got through, hello, it's Lynn on this vehicle. I need to speak to the shift manager now. And the line got called. So you had a speed dial number on your, yeah, on, your like on a mobile the, phone? You press the, the green button and the name comes up, that's the last person you called. You press it again. No problems being able to do that under proper extreme stress. All I wanted to help. That's all I wanted. I knew I couldn't get out because as soon as one of us took any pressure off this guy, he completely overpowered. I mean, he, he kept coming from me. I mean, there's no doubt about it. He looked at me and he saw that I was the smallest of the two. So, you know. And I say that it was reached the majority of the time, but he just got me. Situations. That's a failing in some way, isn't it? Because you, you should always know that. 
you know, you defend yourself as best you can. The safest place in the field. You've got to remember, all I'm focusing on in this job is that what he's taken can ultimately kill him and result in cardiac arrest. That's my focus. <laughs> Believe it or not, for as pathetic as that might sound, that was my focus, that this young man might ultimately die, and I'm becoming aware of the fact that I haven't got an arm that I'm going to be able to perform CPR with. That was all I could think about, was we all had to be safe. And I think I spent the whole 22 minutes saying, and for goodness sake, we just lie still, stop fighting us, we're trying to help you, you're the animal service, you're not the police, what are you doing, what are you kicking me for, stop it. Is your colleague still your colleague? <laughs> My colleagues really wanted to be. <laughs> <laughs> Has anybody received any sort of censure after what happened to you? Has anybody received any sort of censure? Lost the jobs? No. I was to say, in reference to your natural reaction when that was happening, mm -hmm. your natural reaction, as you just said, mm -hmm. was to stay there and try and help. Mm -hmm. Well, we couldn't get out the door to the so The question behind that is, had you had any form of training do you think that would have taken you away from your natural... I should maybe at this point tell you I was a trained police officer. <laughs> so... I just worry about the fact that if training was in part... If I could have run away, I would have run away. Right. I've I, I done it before. Just, just curious, really. I've picked up on two things that you pointed out. Did your role as a paramedic have an influence as to how you accepted the violence from this person? Because you pointed out that you had the need to look after this person who had taken an overdose. But at the same time, this is the person assaulting you. I mean, how do you then, do you kind of accept it to a degree because the need to perform your duties, but at the same time, you're also being assaulted and you kind of dismiss the assault to, one, to the side because of the need to... Your priority is your clinical care. Everything else comes after that. I understand what you're saying there yeah, because I face violence and aggression on the day shift. Mm. And yet, verbal yeah. assault, you ignore them. You don't hear them all the time. Yeah, this I did very similarly. He and his clinical needs was my priority. And yes, I did put myself second. And I know from, I didn't realise that until I went to the River Centre when I was blatantly asked if I could do the same thing again, could I do it? Yes, I would go into that house again and yes, I would treat that gentleman again. But, yeah, but, but yes, this clinical need comes before anything else. So, having experienced all this, what would you advocate, I mean, in terms of that most of us here are trainers, as what kind of training would be beneficial for people that are likely to face these things, seeing that you've had first and experience? Make sure the people in control do their job. I couldn't have done anything differently. I believe me when I say this. I have, even since Wednesday the night this week, at the thought of having to come here today, I have lived and relived and relived and relived that night. I can tell you the clothes that people were wearing, I can tell you the colour of the carpet. To tell you the size of the television screen and that it wasn't a flat screen LCD. You want details, I can give you details, because I lived this. I lived this. But I can't change it. You know, it's just enough, um, as a group, we've never listened, we learned from this. One of the things that um, we very strongly say to people is if they feel they can't safely manage the situation, to get out. What was it that stopped you from getting out? Six adults in a doorway, watching. Six big men. I mean, strong guys. Watching. And a howling screaming granny who's absolutely horrified that her native grandson behaving in such a manner. Were there any repercussions for you? Because you're affected by this, you're bad at this issue. That's them, if they've been involved or not, it's up in the street. We're the professionals, we're the ones in the uniform, we know what we're doing. No. But yeah, that, that's a big question I have. 
why did you come and help? I could be found back in the Are the other service support you do these folks? <coughs> My health and safety manager, Tony Wickham, is yes. And people that saw the last tennis will, will acknowledge that Tony has been exceptionally honest and his exact words where they dropped the ball with me. Um, however, I've been asked to speak at IOS in Nottingham in September, and my line manager, who's the one who didn't manage my absence, is doing everything can to then go. I think that's the worst thing you said there. They, they dropped the ball with you, but they continue continuing to drop the ball with every member of staff. I sat with the director of HR recruitment and she basically talked off. And I got annoyed at their lack of response, their lack of input. And I was <laughs> very agile at the time. I <coughs> had my PTSD treatment, so I was quite explosive. And I said to her, I asked her, what's it going to take? Are we going to have to get shot, raped, murdered? What is it going to actually take for the Scottish Ambulance Service to go down into the control room and say, Guy's not good enough. Do your job. And then go back to the line managers and say, Guy's definitely not good enough. And who is the welfare officer anyway? Who's got all this training and support in place to take the pressure off your managers? <coughs> I was told I was saying, uh, being a bit dramatic, that would be a time of that So, two. Just one. Thanks very much. Just one. Just one, 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 one. one. You, you, you talk about Scottish Ambulance Service, um, yeah. uh, and you've obviously spoken in different parts of the country. Is this similar in every other part of the country? Can't speak to that, don't we? No. Don't know. We're the only national ambulance service. Everybody is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.